The petition charges the U.S. with genocide against African colonized people within the borders of the U.S. The petition charges the United States government and many of its white populations of historically committing the crime of genocide against African people inside its borders for some 500 years since our forcible extraction from Africa and enslavement within the borders of the U.S. and continuing on one long continuous up until today, often with the complicity of many U.S. citizens. From the 150 million kidnapped African people who were slaughtered in the passage from Africa to the Americas, to the almost daily police murders of African people from the right of the slave master to hold the power of life and death over enslaved African people to the mass incarceration of African people today. The, the petition complies a body of documented evidence of the far-ranging genocidal crimes against African people. We the underside, undersigned charge the United States government has historically committed the crime of genocide against African people inside its borders and continue to do so today, often with the complicity of many U.S. citizens. It is in the interest of all freedom-loving people worldwide to unite with African people, colonized within the borders of the United States, in our struggle for basic human rights of freedom from state-imposed violence and oppression and for self-determination and liberation with economic and political control over our lives and communities. We will show that despite the heroic struggle of African people for our civil and constitutional rights during the 1960s, African people exist today under conditions in which the U.S. state powers not only fail to protect our health and well-being as expected under full citizenship, but continually inflict state or state-supported violence and terror on us. Although millions of African people perished on the slave ships, on the journey from Africa to the Americans, and though millions of African people were slaughtered by European and American colonizers throughout Africa, and though hundreds of millions of indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere were murdered by Europeans, it is notable that the word genocide did not exist in the English lexicon until its coinage in 1944 in response to the Nazi government mass murder of the Europeans. The African Charge Genocide Petition recognizes that the term genocide is applicable to Africans in the U.S. for the conditions faced historically and today. <clears throat> what is striking here is that the convention was put in place and adopted in 1948. It was clear that it was put in place for purposes of rectifying what had happened to the Jewish people at the hands of the Germans. Plainly put, but what had happened to white people when white people chose to treat other white people, the way white people treats black people. The genocide convention was for whites, notwithstanding what happened to African people and Europe attacked on Africa, extracting millions of Africans. A hundred million Africans, by some count, scattered and enslaved all over the world, many whom died during the long, brutal trip to America and upon landing suffered a hundred years of brutality and lynchings and six hundred years of captivity. And there was no word called genocide. In fact, it was explicit. The word was not applicable to the assault on African people or Africa. In this petition, we represent a synopsis of documented evidence proving the crime of genocide by the United States government against African people. The examples presented apply to every aspect of the definition of genocide and fits the punishable acts of genocide as defined by the United, United Convention. The United States government is responsible for mass murders, mass and discrimin discriminatory imprisonment and oppressive conditions in nearly every aspect of African life, including state-sanctioned violence and murders, miseducation of our children, intervention into our family life, control of reproduction of our women, unemployment and underemployment of people, poor to non-existent health care and martial law and denial of freedom and political assembly, for African people at the U.S. The U.S. state powers not only fail to protect our health and well-being as expected under full citizenship, but continues to inflict state or state-supported violence. Our demands, we want recognition by the international community and progressive and friendly states and people that European and United States powers committed genocide against African people during the times of colonial occupation, kidnapping, enslavement, 
and exploitation and that genocide against African people continues today inside of the United States. We want support for an international tribunal to make judgments of crimes of genocide against African people and solidarity with African self-determination. Reparations to African people estimated at $4 trillion to African people inside the U.S. alone, according to studies conducted at the University of Connecticut. We would like the right to self-determination and the liberation and unification of Africa and African people on the continent of Africa and those who have been forcibly dispersed around the world. Black community control of the police inside the U.S. and, and the end-to-end to U.S. colonial military occupation of the black community. We demand the creation of an international monitoring body covering the daily police violence against African people in the U.S. Finally, it is not our expectation that the United Nations will meet our demands. We understand that the U.N. is a tool of the U.S. and European imperialism. We are clear that the United Nations will never solve the problems of colonized African people. Furthermore, we know that the only African people organized in a revolutionary party, the African People's Socialist Party, led by the African working class and the poor peasants, will win our liberation. Like Chairman O'Malley Yeshatelli said in 1982 at the first International Tribunal for Africans in Brooklyn, New York, 400 years is too damn long to owe anybody anything. Please sign the petition. Uh, Alright, so my name is Michelle and I'm gonna, um, it's, it's a, a song, song but I'm just gonna do, a, do it in poor form. And, and then it's my dedication to Sandra Blaine. So it's like, if I die, just remember it's not suicide. If I become the latest hashtag, they kill our fathers in the streets without a warning sign. And then they laugh because we don't have dads. But may your rest be in peace. May your life be remembered and the memory sweet. I'll keep your name on repeat because your life matters to me. Your life matters to me. I'll keep your name on repeat because your life matters to me. My hair is coily, hips are wide, and skin is tinted dim. I must admit, there was a time when I resented them. The entertainers that amazed me all were light and thin. My hair was permed, although it brought us worth the benefit. And though them chemicals would scar my skin a bit, the kids were critics. The pursuit of nappiness was still a sin. I'd rather blend. And in my sleep, I mixed my coffee with cream. The curse was lifted and my skin was the American dream. White as Coke. Addictive skin pigment to get the highest vote. Big sense of CEO. Privilege reading me at the door. Ain't had to worry about my hell being scared straight. And if I worked in politics, I'd get a tax break. No need to worry about the lights of the poll. I just showed them valid license and I'm likely to go. But my complexion, that's the question. Will my life be revoked? And when they say it's suicide, will they write me a note? And will my people see his lies and revolt? I think of Sandy get a lump in my throat. Similar genders in our cinnamon skin. And since I'm instantly his enemy, this war never ends. But if I die, just remember it's not suicide. If I become the latest hashtag, they kill our fathers in the streets without a warning sign. And then they laugh because we don't have dads. But may your rest be in peace. May your life be remembered and the memory sweet. I'll keep your name on repeat because your life matters to me. And your life matters to me. I'll keep your name on repeat because your life matters to me. Her mind was conscious, hair was locked, and skin was cinnamon. That cracker acted like those facts was not to innocence. That pig had figured that her pigment meant illiterate. No compassion he practiced, no, not a little bit. It just so happens that the law that exists is that your blackness equals guilty if you're white is self-defense. Hit you with the victim cries, wicked system built on lies. Uttermost corruption is destruction in its prime. And our culture is always busting money fucking in crime. With a topic of discussion when we shuck and we jive. But when it comes to us dying, no one comes to our side. They don't love us, they bluffing, so unify, you decide. And if I die, just remember it's not suicide. If I become the latest hashtag, they kill our fathers in the streets without a warning sign, and then they laugh. But may your rest be in peace, and may your life be remembered, and the memory sweet. I'll keep your name on repeat, because your life matters to me, and your life matters to me. I'll keep your name on repeat, because your life matters to me. And that's that peace. October 12, 2014, 5300 South King Drive. 
by Detective George Hernandez. As George Hernandez approached the scene where my son was at, he jumped out the backseat of the car, maybe two steps and opened up fire, striking my son in the back, causing the bullet to travel and exit through his eye socket. Shot him in the back of the leg with a bullet in my hand and causing him this life. Then he found the battery charge against my son and said that he felt for his safety. That's why he um, had to do what he had to do was to protect his fellow officers to open up fighting which is also his son. Then I read the medical examiner report. It said homicide. And it said justified. It said homicide. Homicide means murder, intended kill. They told me that was the way it is. So the state is trying to get it out of charge to this permanent against the murderers. He still has his death job, which is made $80,000 a year for murder. Because that's exactly what he was paying for for murder. And I'm asking everyone that is in this room, we know it's an extra time. Get out and vote. Get the state attorney to leave the alphabet out of office because we already know that she don't put the officers on her. And if we don't stand up and fight against the system, it's going to be more murder. There's going to be justified when we all know it wasn't justified. Because we all know when you make it to the city, your public officers, public stand out what's going on. You don't jump around and back to someone's car and shoot a suspect that's running away from you. Then you kill them and plant a gun on them. They say, I know the gun was planted because my son was left in. He was his right hand. They got the gun out of his right hand. And then he found from the impact from the bullet, the way he was shot, ain't no way the brother you still gonna hold a gun in your hand and you fall in the on your face and you still hold a gun in your hand and you land on your face. It's just impossible. And it's, it's hard to deal with on a day to day basis. You lost your child, you took the streets, and you had a gang fight, you just thought maybe you would have lost his life that way. But for the people that's supposed to serve and protect you and kill you, that's right. My son left behind five kids, ages ranging from eight to four. Who won't take the other kids? I have to step up now and be the grandmother and the father that's gone.
We don't we have, have no problem with making babies, babies, but we, we can't, can't keep them alive. alive. So, so if, if the, the police, police are not killing us, us the, the hospitals, hospitals are killing us. us. If, if the, the hospital, hospital is not killing us, us we killing kill ourselves because of the conditions that we're living under are so heinous that we would rather die than live. So we shouldn't be afraid of the word revolution. Because we just, I just laid out all the reasons why we are not afraid of dying. So I say that I live for the people. And I would die for the people. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to afford the revolution. If you want to, if you want to dig the problem up, go to the core of it and destroy the state. In 1997, my brother, my, my other brother, he was completely opposite. He didn't sell no. Um, he went to school and got a college scholarship and really tried to do everything that America tell you you can do to get a piece of the American pie. But it still wasn't enough. He went to a party and he lost his life. I said in the courtroom, not once, but three times, and this is when I really understood that America, that courtroom don't work for us. The lady that they say is blindfold, she see, she see color. Because my brother's life did not matter to that court system. And the man that killed my brother walked out the courtroom with me. And my dad was in handcuffs because he had an outburst. Because his junior is dead. And his murderer is walking out the same courtroom with us. So I say that America created me to be a revolutionary. Because I am... Totally convinced that there's no other way, but the only other way, the only solution for African people is revolution. The only solution for this problem is revolution. But it's something that we have to go beyond talking. We have to go beyond coming to meetings and more day events and marching and raising our hand up and following the UN. We have to go beyond that. And the beyond that is structure, organization, and having a certain kind of stance. See, I want freedom so bad that I'm not, I'm willing to shake anything that I have to shake. I don't care about my ego. I don't care if I have to offer up a criticism. I don't care what I have to do because I want to be free. And when I was going to the church, they used to always say, I'm going to give you a scripture. Because I believe that Jesus was a revolutionary. He died for the people. And he went against the system that was oppressing people. It's a scripture that says that the way to heaven is very narrow. And I say that the way to the revolution is very narrow. You can't take everything with you. Because this system that we've been a part of has, has a lot of ugly things that we have to change our colonized mind. Our mind and everything we think Every, they have systems to control our mind. Everything, the way we want to dress, the way we want to look, and everything is agenda being pushed on us. And I understand that I have to have a revolutionary mind. How do I get a revolutionary mind? I have to have structure, organization, and discipline myself for a certain kind of stance to make revolution. That is the only solution. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge our mortars. You know, I, I, I just want to say that I really um, brushed myself because um, anytime I see mothers speak about their sons, it, it, it aches my heart. Because I know what it takes for her to come in here and have to continue to tell the same story. That this is something that when she, we all go home and we go to sleep, but you know, she has to, she has to live with it. She can't see her son no more. She can't, he won't laugh no more. He won't talk no more. He, she can't go in the bathroom after him when he's thinking up. You know, all those things that you used to get on your nerves that you wish so badly that you could just smell it again. You know, and so um, I brushed myself and I really wanted to um, have the sister to do uh, a corn, but uh, I'll have her do it afterwards. But today is Mortar's Day, and um, Mortar's Day is February the 21st. 
And as we know, that this is the day that Malcolm X was murdered. And, you know, I used to celebrate, as a Christian, I used to celebrate, you know, Easter. And, and it was so exciting. And as I was sitting here thinking about my ancestors, when I was thinking about Martin Luther King, and when I was thinking about Fred Hampton Sr., when I was thinking about Malcolm X, and I said Malcolm X, when I was thinking about all of our different mortars, I said this is a celebration because I am determined to forward what they started. They did not kill the revolution. They could kill me today before the revolution. That's what we are called to do. That is our call to forward the revolution. And that's the only solution to this problem that we in. And so the organization that I represent is CPDO, the International People Democratic Uhuru Movement, Omala Yeshatela. Um, the, the, um, the International People Democratic Uhuru Movement has been around for 40 plus years. It has a solid foundation to bring people into a political life that we've been pushed out of. Before I met Amalia Chatella in the streets of Ferguson, I didn't even know who Marcus Garvey was, and I was 35 years old. I knew more about scripture and the Bible than I knew anything about black power and who was fighting for liberation or who have died to set me free. We have to change that. And I believe that we are. I believe that after the uprising in Ferguson, because we emphasize and you know about Mike Brown and you know God rest, you know let his soul rest in peace. But the significance of Ferguson is the people of St. Louis, Missouri. And if you heard me, I did not say the people of Ferguson because I actually live in Ferguson, but I know that it was St. Louis as a whole that came out to the streets and took to the streets and resisted. And resistance is what bringing all of us that made Beyonce get on the stage and do a song, made Kendrick Lamar get on the uh, stage and sing a song. The people of Ferguson, the people of Chicago, the people of Baltimore, African people that been in the streets resisting have pushed celebrities and everyone else to say these things. Because Chairman O'Malley always say that the music will change when the people change. The music will become revolutionary when we become revolutionary. So it's our job to continue to push the message of revolution, to push the message that black power matters. Our power matters and these things are happening to us because we are people with no power. And so the struggle has to be for power. As my comrade Will was up here and he was reading me. And one of the things that Will has said that we are not trying to change the ideas in people's head. This is not about racism. Racism is a symptom of colonialism. But the core issue is that one group of people got power over another group of people, and them people don't have no power. And so until them people have power, then we're going to continue to have the same problem that we have today. So it has to be not to change the idea. I don't care if white people like me or not, but I do care if white people have power to do something to me and I can't do nothing back.